uh, Town Hall is a, a spectacular venue. Um, always such wonderful audiences with wonderful questions. Uh, also, um, Seattle, you know, is a, a real intellectual hub, and it's just it's just great to be back. I in my last book really was architecture based, and I started giving these presentations uh, with the visuals, and it turned out this was actually a really good way to introduce a book. Uh, for this book, my period happens to coincide with the, the first golden age of photography. Uh, so many of the characters, characters being a term nonfiction writers use for actual people who lived and uh, when you're writing about this period passed away uh, many, many decades ago, um, are photographed. So a lot of the people and places are, are, are I can show you. Uh, we ran one photo per chapter in the book, but with this uh, kind of presentation, we can show as many as possible, so I'm going to take advantage of that. First, I'm going to explain how I came to write the book. Then I'm going to uh, kind of walk you through the general uh, argument of the book as told through the characters. And then uh, initially, I'd been kind of separating out my college talk from my bookstore talk. Um, but I've got such wonderful questions uh, in places like this and bookstores that I've kind of combined them. And I'm, going to ask you to put on your thinking caps a little bit, and I'm going to walk you through uh, a legal case or two um, where I read the records and uh, got into a really, led me into new and interesting places. Uh, I will explain further as we go forward. Finally, there'll be some Q&A, uh, and then I'd be happy to sign copies of my book. So I, um, I'm not from New Orleans. I live in New Orleans. Uh, I joke that since my mother's from Brooklyn, New York, and my dad's from Birmingham, Alabama, I grew up with a New Orleans accent. Uh, those of you who have been to New Orleans will get that joke. Um, so I moved to New Orleans uh, and decided to educate myself on, on the, the, the history of the city. I moved there in 2010. Um, I knew a little bit about uh, vaguely Ruby Bridges and the desegregation of the public schools in the 1960s. And I wanted to learn more. So I went to um, JSTOR, which is the social science and history search engine where you come up with academic history papers. And I put in the search terms New Orleans and school desegregation. I got over 100 hits, and 99 of them were about the 1960s, and one of them was about the 1870s. And I had no idea the New Orleans Public School District had been desegregated in the 1870s. And I, you know, I always loved American history. I've read major works on Reconstruction, and it just never really hit me. So of course, I clicked on that paper. It took me to this. This is published in 1962 in the American Historical Association's publication, the American Historical Review. So it's an academic journal specifically for uh, experts on American history. And the very first sentence uh, of this paper is this. It's, it's an academic run-on sentence, but I will <laughs> briefly subject you to it. It is a fact not generally known even to historians that the New Orleans public schools during the Reconstruction period underwent substantial racial desegregation over a period of six and a half years an experience shared by no other southern community until after 1954 and by few northern communities at the time. So even in this publication, specifically for experts on American history, the article begins with, you probably don't know that the New Orleans public schools were desegregated in this time period. And I did not, and I voraciously read this article. And then I started thinking, well, what else do I not know? And I started poking around, and I came across the astounding fact, at least to me, that uh, at the height of Reconstruction between 1873 and 1877, the state university, the University of South Carolina, in the state capital of Columbia, South Carolina, was desegregated as well. This is an article from 1911, written by one of the African-American alumni of the university. As you can see, the headline is, When Negroes Attended the State University. Keep poking around. The streetcar system of New Orleans and Charleston and a handful of other southern cities were desegregated during Reconstruction. In New Orleans, the streetcars are not resegregated until 1902, and in Charleston, not formally resegregated until 1912. So you can imagine, by the time these, these transit systems are resegregated, there are a handful of little old men and little old ladies who can even remember them having, having been um, segregated before. Exact same thing with the police departments. Again, New Orleans, Charleston, a handful of other cities, uh, and, and not resegregated till the early 20th century. Uh, the 1910 census is the first census since the Civil War that finds not a single African-American police officer in the Deep South, not till 1910. So I 
was floored by this and thought, okay, well, I need to read a book on this. This is really interesting stuff, and I'm going to go read a book. And I went to the bookstores and the libraries, and I didn't find anything. So then I naively signed up to write this book and dove into the archives and found things like this. Uh, the Orleans Parish School District, the local school board, records are housed at the, uni the public college, University of New Orleans, in their archive. And I went there, and I requested the uh, minutes uh, from the period I was interested in, from 1871 to 1877, when this article told me the district had been desegregated. And I was presented with, with this volume. These are volumes of, they're all written in the same hand. Sort of one secretary copies all the incoming correspondence, outgoing correspondence, meeting minutes, budgetary figures. And this, this document literally goes from 1865 to 1870 and 1877 to 1878. So it skips the entire period I was interested in. And when you go, when you open this up, literally on page 399 of this giant ledger book, you're in 1870. And you flip the page to 400, and you're in 1877. Missing the entire period I was interested in. Uh, at the archives of the University of South Carolina, I found something similar. Uh, there's something called the Clariosophic Society, which exists to this day. It's a debating, student debating society. And the uh, minutes and budgetary figures for that uh, period, for the desegregation period, have been uh, blotted out with what I think are supposed to look like pictographs of tombstones with the words Negro regime and then not clariosophics, um, and then you know enough black ink to uh, make some of the records illegible. Luckily, you cannot completely destroy uh, the memory of a period of American history, at least not yet. Uh, we have, uh, there was so much newspaper coverage of the events I wanted to write about. Uh, back then, uh, major cities, even small cities, had multiple newspapers, uh, as you can see, from representing different communities, language groups, political outlooks. And so I was able to read about all of the events I was interested in from multiple perspectives, which was great. So you not only could try to, re pun intended, reconstruct the events, you also got a really good sense of who thought what about the various events. This was big news at the time, and it's covered in all the major national media as well. There's an amazing article uh, in Harper's about the desegregation of the New Orleans public schools. Uh, the nation covers civil rights in this period extensively. Um, to its eternal shame, something that you'll still see occasionally flagged in the magazine today, it flip-flops on civil rights in this period. Uh, in the enthusiastic period right after the Civil War, the nation is very pro-equal rights. And then by the mid-1870s, it's turned against civil rights. You also get um, coverage in major African-American and abolitionist newspapers, such as the New National Era, Frederick Douglass's paper out of Washington, D.C., and The Liberator, the abolitionist paper of William Lloyd Garrison from Boston. I also had, found a wonderful uh, source in court records. So we think of civil rights test cases as something uh, from the 1950s and 1960s. But civil rights test cases are huge in the, in the 1870s. Um, and those records are very well preserved. Both things like this, this is the case that orders the desegregation of the New Orleans public schools. And this is a brief from the attorney, from the plaintiffs. So it's a, it's a state legislator who has a school-aged son. So it's on behalf of the father and son suing the school district. Uh, and then you also have the equivalent of the stenographer's notes. I mean, literally every question in a court case that's asked, every objection, is it sustained? Is it overruled? Uh, the, what, what the witnesses say, um, all of that is meticulously copied down in handwriting, uh, and you can read through those cases almost like a play. As you can already see, again and again, I, keep coming, I kept coming back to New Orleans and Charleston as the places that saw the greatest civil rights progress in this era. And the question is why? Um, both are port cities, and both are using, really until the, the, until the Civil War, are not quite using the Anglo-American racial system of black and white. Uh, you have sort of the full color spectrum in these cities, in part because you have immigrants from, literally from Scotland through the, all the way down through Southern Europe into the Middle East and then Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and you also have open interracial relationships. Uh, so you have a large community in both cities of what we call free people of color. These are uh, folks who are free 
generally until the Civil War have good, good as good relationships with their white sides and, and non-white sides as you know any other um, family member in any family. You know, there are always people who don't talk to their dad, don't talk to their mom, of course, but they're no they're no better or worse uh, than any than anyone else. And the fact that their parents have different races is not something that's hidden. Uh, and it's not something that's denied. In, in New Orleans, in the first, uh, first few censuses after the um, annexation of the purchase of the Louisiana Territory, that's those all but the very furthest bar to the left, um, you see this, this uh, sort of dark gray bar. That's, that denotes free people of color. Um, the darkest bar is enslaved people, and the lightest bar is free people. Uh, and for the first four censuses, there are actually more free people of color than enslaved people of color in New Orleans. Now, that's not to minimize the role that the slave trade played as central to the city's economy. Um, there, were, there was constant churn of enslaved people coming into the city in chains being sold and then moved off to the, the plantation of, of the, whoever the purchaser was. But on the actual streets of the city, the, the rooted population, free people of color outnumbered enslaved people. And you can imagine um, how different this was, even from a place like rural Mississippi, which even back then you could, you know, was a day trip away. So all of a sudden, someone from rural Mississippi might show up in this in this place, and all of a sudden, race and class, or even race and caste, caste is a better term because you know slave status is inherited, and um, indeed slave ownership was often inherited as well. Uh, don't line up as neatly as they do in Mississippi where, you know, from someone's co skin color, you can already determine uh, so many things about their, their caste status. Charleston has a, is, is very linked to the Caribbean um, in the colonial period. New Orleans, of course, is literally a Latin American city founded as a colony of France and becomes a colony of Spain before it's purchased by America. Charleston is always an Anglo colony, but it's very rooted to the, in the Caribbean. Fully six of the first governors in the colonial period of uh, of Charleston are, are immigrants from Barbados, not immigrants from England. And there's an understanding, uh, again, sometimes kind of tacit understanding, that in the islands people are mixed and that when people immigrate from Barbados, their actual racial background uh, is likely mixed. Um, that's why in South Carolina you do not see a law against interracial marriage until after the Civil War. Now that's you know, that, that, that's, that's not because, that, that my take on this is it's because they didn't really want to adjudicate everyone's race every time someone got married. Because then all of a sudden, all these members of the, the ostensibly white elite of South Carolina who had immigrated from Barbados, all of a sudden you have to kind of look back into their genealogy and see what their ancestry is. And like New Orleans, although not as pronounced, you have a very large mixed race, free people of color population. It never outnumbers the enslaved population. These are some census figures. Um, but it is a significant uh, population, and you do have a kind of communal consciousness. Um, just after the American Revolution, for the first time, the church where the white elite of South Carolina and their mixed-race relatives have worshipped together for generations uh, tells the mixed-race community that they can, still, they can still worship in the church, they can still even get married in the church, but they can't be buried in the churchyard anymore. And that necessitates this founding of something called the Brown Fellowship Society, which is uh, an organization of mixed race free people uh, that's initially created just to get a burial plot where they can be buried, but ends up spawning a debating society and a credit union and a whole host of communal organizations. Um, I think the word Brown strikes us as slightly uncomfortable. Um, I think the way we should think of it in the spirit of how they thought of it is they weren't saying we're not black, we're not white, we're brown. They were saying we are black and we are white, we're brown. And I think that that's, a, that's truer uh, to their self-perception. Uh, I think it, we need to kind of, as anytime we're writing about history or thinking about history, try to put ourselves in the mindset uh, of the people at the time and don't you necessarily impose our categories on earlier periods. Uh, part of what's so interesting about history and I hope potentially liberating about history is thinking about how the categories we take for granted were created and formed and why and, and getting a sense of their contingency and their uh, constant uh, metamorphosis even in our own time. <laughs>
Now I'd like to read you a little excerpt uh, about one of the characters, uh, Afro-Creole characters. So over and over, the mixed race community in the period after the Civil War takes the lead in civil rights activism, particularly in court cases, um, in part uh, because their status is being reduced um, as the black-white system is imposed on, upon them, but also because they have the means to take a case, say, to the Supreme Court. I mean, there's no ACLU in this era. There's no NAACP legal defense fund. If you want to take, if you're discriminated against, you want to take a case to the Supreme Court, you need to hire a lawyer. You probably need to buy them a ticket to Washington, D.C. to argue the case and boarding house and board and all of that. Um, so you do see this disproportionate uh, leadership from this openly mixed race uh, free, pe free people of color community. And one of them is this gentleman here who I will read to you about now. On March 12, 1864, a pair of Southern gentlemen, E. Arnold Bertineau, shown left, and John Depp Baptiste Rudinet arrived at the White House to lobby President Abraham Lincoln, shown right. They hailed from New Orleans, a city that had been retaken by the Union just one year into the Civil War and had become a testing ground for what the multiracial nation might look like when the war was won. The visitors were leaders of the city's distinctive, openly mixed race Afro-French community, and they presented the president with a petition signed by 1,000 of their fellow property-owning free men of color demanding the right to vote. At the time, this was an audacious ask. Though the petitioners addressed the president as, quote, citizens of the United States, technically this was no longer true. Seven years before their visit to the White House, the nation's highest court had revoked their citizenship. In the Dred Scott case, a dispute ostensibly over slaves' rights, the Supreme Court of the United States had declared that an African American, whether enslaved or free, had, quote, no rights which the white man was bound to respect and is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. According to the Supreme Court, the petitioners had no right that Lincoln was bound to respect, but they were hardly his inferiors. Lincoln had been born in a log cabin in Kentucky, and though whip smart, he had completed just a single year of formal schooling. By contrast, Rudinet was a trained engineer. Bertineau, for his part, made his living as a wine merchant, that most refined of professions. In aristocratic fashion, this son of a French father and an Afro-Cuban mother went by his middle name. Lincoln was so low-born that he didn't even have one. <laughs> the wine merchant kept tabs, while well, the wine merchant kept tabs on the Paris auction prices of the latest Loire Valley vintages, the rail splitter turned commander-in-chief's entire international experience amounted to visiting the Ontario side of Niagara Falls once. In fact, it was Lincoln's youthful trips down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, especially his month-long sojourn there in 1831, that constituted the deepest cosmopolitan immersion of his life. For Lincoln, the meeting with Bertineau and Rudinet may well have felt like a visit from foreign dignitaries, if not interplanetary ambassadors. But the strangest thing of all about these visitors was their racial identity. Though these men were light enough to pass for white, Rudinet was just one-eighth African, Bertineau, with his rakish wave of dark hair, looked like a stereotypical Frenchman. They clearly had no interest in doing so. Bertineau and Rudinet were of partial African descent, and they were completely unabashed about it, willing to go to the White House as rep community representatives of African Americans in their state. They didn't feel that their African heritage made them any less American than their French heritage did. Lincoln, by contrast, with his dark features and anomalous height, had spent his entire political career dodging scurrilous rumors that he secretly had African ancestors. And part of showing these photos, I think, is thinking about how we kind of do race. I say by the time we're 12 or 13, we have, we're, in America, we're almost like Olympic class athletes at like putting people in racial categories. Um, but how much of that is the things we think about as racial, you know, skin color, hair texture, eye color, and how much of that are other things, speech patterns, clothing, um, if I, you know, if, if this was not the most famous American who ever lived on the right, and I told you one of these men is of partial African descent, you would undoubtedly guess incorrectly. Again, these, this mixed race community becomes the real leaders of, of in this initial struggle for civil rights. In Charleston, uh, maybe the community leader par excellence is this individual, Francis Louis Cardozo. Um, he's the son of a Sephardic Jewish father and a free woman of color mother. And he um, ends up going to Scotland for his education because no American university will take him on racial grounds despite his uh, obvious brilliance and accomplishment. And he makes e equal opportunity in education the cause of his life. 
Um, he heads the, in, in reconstruction period, he heads the education committee at the South Carolina Constitutional Convention and gets a plank in, that in the state constitution of South Carolina under reconstruction that schools and universities cannot desegregate, cannot segregate their student bodies or their faculty. And then he goes to Columbia, the state capital, uh, as the secretary of state, he gets elected um, and ensures that the University of South Carolina is desegregated in this period. Uh, the individual who actually enrolls is this fellow, and I'm going to read you um, uh, an excerpt on him. On October 7, 1873, Henry E. Hayne, shown left, with the proud bearing of an elite brown Charlestonian, entered the university library. It was a space of supreme dignity, its light-filled, columned interior a model of Palladian proportion. A bust of Robert Y. Hayne, the now-deceased former Charleston mayor, South Carolina governor and U.S. senator, and Henry's white uncle, shown right, silently looked down on the proceedings as his biracial nephew signed the, his name into the ledger of enrolled medical students. In response, a white medical student from Columbia, R. Gordon Sloan, marched to the ledger and ostentatiously struck out his own name from the registration book, defacing the volume in the process. Several other white students followed suit, vehemently crossing out their names, thereby dropping out of the school. When Scribner's monthly correspondent Edward King arrived in Columbia later that week, he noted the jarring contrast between the college's placid arboreal campus and the events that were rocking it. Quote, the venerable university, nestled charmingly in the midst of a grand tree-clotted park, gives the casual visitor the impression that he is visiting a grove of academe rather than a perturbed capital, King wrote. Remarkably, the northern correspondent noted that the bust of Robert Wyhane was, was in the library, but failed to make the connection between the Haynes statue and the Haynes student, noting, quote, the busts of John C. Calhoun and Robert Y. Haynes seemed to look down from their niches with astonishment upon the changed order of things, and leaving it at that. Many Northerners, King apparently included, assumed that when African Americans shared the last names of leading white Southern families, it was because they or their ancestors had been owned by those families as slaves, not because they were biologically part of those families, or both. White Southerners did little to disabuse clueless Yankees of this notion and sometimes actively dissembled. The Columbia Daily Phoenix greeted Haynes' enrollment with the Freudian slip that, quote, the races can no more agree in the same classes in school or college than they can in churches or in the family. Robert Y. Hayne had died a year before his mixed race nephew was born, so there's no telling how he would have greeted his matriculation either privately or publicly. But for Henry Hayne's white cousin, noted poet Paul Hamilton Hayne, the mythic bonds of whiteness that connected him to complete strangers among the state's Caucasian population outweighed his actual blood ties to Henry. Not long after his biracial cousin had been elected Secretary of State in the radical Republican sweep of 1872, Paul railed in a letter over, quote, rogues and Negroes in political power. The faculty of the University of South Carolina is also desegregated in this period is by this individual, Richard T. Greener, who uh, should be even more famous than he is. Uh, he's the first non-white graduate of Harvard. He is the uh, descendant of um, sort of Spaniards who had moved to the U.S. via Puerto Rico and um, African Americans who they uh, intermarried with once they arrived uh, in, the, in what's today the continental United States. Um, and he is recruited by Cardozo uh, to essentially bring in a faculty member who know, who of such uh, academic accomplishment that no one could possibly uh, argue that he was not qualified for the job. Uh, similarly, as I, I mentioned, the streetcar systems are desegregated. Uh, and again, with the, the types of activism we associate with the 1960s, including um, sit-ins. This is a rare photograph of uh, what was called a star car in New Orleans just after the Civil War. Uh, and the way this system worked was that um, these maybe a, a fifth of the cars had black stars painted on them, and those were the only cars that African Americans were permitted to board. Um, and this sparks uh, a, a movement in the in the spring of 1867 uh, to desegregate the streetcars, uh, erupting simultaneously, actually, in New Orleans and in Charleston. Um, in Charleston, the, the streetcars are desegregated uh, through the activism of a woman who, sadly, we have no uh, extant images of. Um, but who, you know, should be as famous as Rosa Parks, and I think her activism is um, 
has is, is a remarkable foreshadowing of, of Parks's activism. I'll read an excerpt. On April 17th, 1867, a complaint materialized at the local Freedmen's Bureau office filed by Mary P. Bowers, an African-American Charlestonian who had been forced off a streetcar. In an impeccably written statement, Bowers recounted the outrage. Though she had previously ridden the streetcar system without incident, she explained, this time when she boarded, the, street, the conductor objected. Being, quote, very unwell and much fatigued from a long walk, unquote, she nonetheless took a seat. Bowers found herself next to, quote, Dr. North, one of our most respectable physicians, unquote, who had no objection to her presence. But the conductor refused to drive the car with her in it. As tensions rose, Dr. North suggested that Bowers debark since she was, quote, too respectable a person to create an excitement on a streetcar. She replied, the very fact of my being a respectable person is sufficient reason for my being allowed to ride. Eventually tiring of the standoff in the airless, mobilized streetcar, Bowers decided to give up for now, but she vowed that she would see the conductor in court. Quote, as I am detaining these gentlemen from their business and the children from their mealtime, I will leave the car, but for no other reason, she told him, and if there is a way, I will make you pay dear for it. Little is known of Bowers' biography, but from her assertion that she had ridden the streetcars many times before without incident, and the descriptions of her even in the white press as, quote, respectable, it is likely that she was free before the Civil War and of such mixed African and European ancestry that her racial categorization under a black-white binary system was unclear. Bowers' erudite letter of complaint, quote, respectfully applying for redress, unquote, strongly suggests that she was literate and educated. The perfect legalese of her account stands in stark contrast to most Freedmen's Bureau complaints, which recount heartbreaking tales of oppression in heartbreakingly broken English. In a time when educational opportunities for women were limited and patriarchal family structures the norm, free biracial women in Charleston and New Orleans stood apart. Antebellum census forms show free, quote, mulattresses as they were known, vastly overrepresented in jobs requiring literacy and special training, including positions as school teachers and principals, boarding house operators, nurses, and midwives. The system of plassage in New Orleans, which is a um, interracial union recognized by the church but not by the state, um, and its less formalized analog in Charleston, resulted in free women of color serving as heads of households heads of their households in an era when female-headed households were rare. Just two weeks after, with, under, with the Reconstruction authorities you know, in place in Charleston uh, from the federal government, uh, just two weeks after this complaint is filed, the streetcars of Charleston are desegregated, and they will not be resegregated for 45 years. In New Orleans, there's a, there's a protest on uh, Congo Square, the kind of main African-American gathering place in the city to this day. Um, and under pressure, the streetcar company uh, presidents um, in, in those eras, different lines were they were private companies with public contracts and they each line was kind of run by a different company. Uh, they roll over again almost immediately uh, when, when pushed by activists and federal power. Um, and incidentally, the president of the St. Charles Avenue streetcar line, who's the most uh, eager to sort of roll over for the activists, surprisingly enough, is former uh, retired Confederate General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, who is born uh, who fi literally fires the first shot of the Civil War, is born 15 miles from New Orleans, and is the streetcar company president uh, when this all happens. And incidentally, when he returns from the war in 1865, he's walking to his mother's house uh, in Algiers, which is a, 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 the neighborhood across the river from the center of New Orleans. Um, and he's stopped on the street by a man and called the N-word. The uh, man says, I know who you are, I know the backstory. Um, that you're, you're not white. Um, he does not respond. He goes home to his mom. Um, but, and, their, and their, family, their family lore is that they are um, descended from French and Italian aristocrats, um, which, you know, which I have no reason to doubt. Uh, but un undoubtedly, you know, the, an individual who looks like this realizes that in a society where everyone is free and uh, you may have a racial line drawn, um, this could be trouble. Uh, and indeed, when he desegregates his streetcar line and people are kind of flummoxed, uh, he gives the defense that gives the title to the book. He says, when you ride the streetcars of New Orleans, you are riding in common, quote, with thieves, prostitutes, gamblers, and others who have worse sins to answer for than the accident of color. <laughs> and his, um, his, his activism goes quite far in this era. He becomes the, there's a movement at the height of Reconstruction in 1873 called the Unification Movement where uh, 50 white-identified businessmen in New Orleans and 50 African-colored-identified 
uh, businessmen come together to accept civil rights and sort of move forward as one. And Beauregard is the celebrity endorser. Um, and there's, they, you know, what, this is their equal rights, one flag, one country, one people is their slogan. Uh, and they, they gonna unveil, uh, they unveil their platform at this community meeting and these are the hundred uh, and, uh, men, there are men who uh, are endorsing, it's uh, alphabetical, you see General Gustav G.T. Beauregard um, right, right up top. Um, incidentally, Beauregard does not show up to this meeting. Uh, un unclear exactly why, uh, but soon after, after this kind of high point of uh, equal rights, acceptance of equal rights, um, things uh, begin to collapse uh, quite quickly. Uh, I want to um, read you a little bit of a, a case from this era, from a civil rights case from this era. Um, I think it, it gets to the heart of what I find so interesting about this material. Um, when we think about how race works in America, I mean, like some of this Beauregard story uh, of getting called the N-word on the streets of New Orleans is, is, uh, is illustrative. Um, there are actually multiple questions. It's not an obvious and clear-cut thing, even though we think it is. I mean, there's, there's the question, what is my actual background? Then there's, you know, what do you perceive my background to be? Um, and then there's a third question that we're realizing with 23andMe is not is, is a, an extra question, which is, well, what do I think my background is? So there's like, what's, what's the actual background? What do I think it is and what do you think it is? And those things don't necessarily match up. Um, and by raising this uh, in, in some of the court cases, in the civil, of the civil rights court cases of this era, um, there's an attempt uh, by the Creole of color community, particularly in New Orleans, to kind of tweak race and ask these questions uh, in a kind of arch uh, and ironic and careful way. Um, and it, it, it's, it's fascinating. Um, it's not a very successful legal strategy, unfortunately, um, but it is fascinating. I think it really speaks to our time. Uh, I want to read you a little bit from one of the, this is from court records that I you know, pieced together from the transcript. Um, it often fell to government officials themselves to have the states of Louisiana's civil rights laws enforced. A Louisiana law required that all places of business or public resort shall be open to the accommodation and patronage of all persons without distinction or discrimination on account of color or race. And it permitted those who still face discrimination to sue for damages. In January 1871, the newly elected Orleans Parish Sheriff Charles St. Alban Sauvenet did just that after being refused a drink in an upscale French quarter bois. A freeborn Creole with a French immigrant father and a mother of racially ambiguous Haitian descent, Sauvenet had entered the bank, a posh coffee house and bar with two business associates named Finnegan and Conklin. Sauvenet had patronized the bar many times before, presumably passing for white. But now that he was a public figure, it was widely believed that despite his fair complexion, he was of partial African descent. This time when Sauvenet walked in, the bar owner, Joseph A. Walker, requested that he stop visiting the bank as a personal favor since it was bad for business. Quote, I have always drunk in all houses, Sauvignet replied, and it is too late for me to go back now. Six days later, Sauvignet filed a suit, quote, for the vindication of his civil rights. He demanded a crippling settlement, $10,000, and the revocation of the cafe's business license. The case unfolded in a curious way. According to the Louisiana civil rights law, Sauvignet's race, whatever it might be, was irrelevant to whether he could be served. Indeed, that was the whole point of the public accommodations law. Yet much of the courtroom testimony was dedicated to figuring out his race. In court, Walker's lawyers began this line of inquiry as a way of ta attacking Sauvignet's credibility and his claim that service had been denied on racial grounds. They insinuated that he had long passed for white and only began identifying himself as biracial to win African-American votes in the recent election. In fact, in a city like New Orleans where most residents identified as white in those, in those times, it would have been a wiser electoral strategy to continue passing. It had been Sauvignet's political opponents who had insisted that he was a man of color. On the witness stand, Sauvignet quipped, I am very much astonished that I should be wanted to be proven a white man when a few months ago during the campaign, I was called a Negro. Contrary to the defense counsel's insinuation for his entire life, Sauvignet explained, quote, my general reputation in the community was that I was a person of color. Even though, quote, whether I'm colored, a colored man or not is a matter that I myself do not know. His parents, he explained, had both been born abroad in societies where humans were not sorted into binary racial categories. In New Orleans, he had long been considered a Creole of color and was an active member of that community. Quote, prior to the war, he told the court, the government had clearly considered him non-white since, quote, you had always refused me, though born and raised here, the rights of citizenship, unquote, 
But in his social life, neither had he tried to pass for white, nor had he been treated as a second-class citizen. Quote, it was my habit before the war to go into different saloons and bar rooms and drink as white men did, he explained. Only now was he being denied service. As the case unfolded, Sauvignet did not resist the adjudication of, of his race with a simple insistence on equal rights for all. Instead, he focused his case on it. Sauvignet actively called into question the entire edifice of race. He volunteered that, quote, Finnegan and Conklin, who were with me, are said to be white men. I do not know. To all, experiences they are, to all appearances, they are. But of course, as Sauvignet himself proved, you couldn't necessarily ascertain people's races by looking at them. The ineffability of race was reiterated when Finnegan took the stand and told the court that, quote, I did not know that Sauvignet was a colored man by his appearance. If race could exist independent of physical appearance, by what metric could it be adjudicated? Before the war, as free people of color lost suffrage rights and other former class-based rights became race-based, a tautology of race had formed. Once all native-born free white men were given the right to vote, then any native-born free men who were denied the right to vote must be, by definition, people of color, regardless of their skin tone. But with the collapse of the race-based rights regime, what was left of race itself? When Walker's attorney grew frustrated with Sauvignet's circular definition, clearly I must be a person of color because before the Civil War I was not permitted to vote, he asked him point blank, quote, have you not stated that you are as much a white man and of white blood as any man in the community? Sauvignet answered him with a quip, I have stated so, ain't I? Asserting that racism creates race, not vice versa, Sauvignet's curious courtroom performance suggests he saw more hope in undermining the concept of race than in accepting it and calling for equal treatment regardless. Fortuitously, Sauvignet's case ended up in front of the judge who had months before ordered the desegregation of the New Orleans public schools, Henry Dibble. As the father of a mixed-race daughter, Sauvignet himself had been among the activist parents attempting to enroll children in the Bayou Road School and had been vindicated by, Dib by Dibble's decision in the desegregation case. Now, unsurprisingly, Dibble found in Sauvignet's favor. But the Indiana-born Dibble did not follow Sauvignet down the path of questioning race itself. Instead, Dibble personally adjudicated Sauvignet's race, finding in his decision that, quote, the plaintiff is reputed to be and is a colored man, unquote. Given his racial identity, his demand for justice was, quote, in full consonance with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the National Constitution, abolishing slavery and extending to men of African descent, whether they had been slaves or not, the rights of citizenship in the Republic and in the states in which they reside. As for punishment, Dibble opted to leave the business open, but teach the proprietor a lesson to, quote, deter others from inflicting the same injury. Walker was permitted to keep his liquor license, but ordered to pay Sauvignet $1,000 because, quote, the plaintiff showed an infringement of civil rights and that his citizenship has been degraded. Dibble's decision was a victory over racism, but it was not the victory over race that Sauvignet had sought. And indeed, um, this, this sort of blurry color line, while it doesn't it's never victorious in court, even when they raise it. And I think these cases are fascinating uh, when they do raise it. Uh, even though that is never successful as a legal argument, the actual color continuum on the streets uh, of New Orleans and to a certain degree Charleston uh, make segregation actually difficult. Um, this is a, a, a diary from a student, a white student who was uh, in school during it. There's a wildcat attempt in 1874 to resegregate the schools by vigilantes, um, except the vigilantes can't figure out who's white and who's not. Um, and you see in this diary, um, she, writes, this is, she writes this as an adult, kind of reminiscing, but she writes, the men of NO, meaning New Orleans, stood behind us, gave us badges to wear, and thus we were protected. So by some metric, whether it was pedigree or brown paper bag test or something, the ruffians who were trying to resegregate the school um, had created some definition of what a white person was, and then given the students who met that qualification this badge to wear so that their, their whiteness could be discerned by ruffians trying to resegregate the schools. And Harper says this wonderful article uh, about this attempt, very kind of tongue-in-cheek, mocking the vigilantes. Um, they, tried, they confused several uh, Jewish students with creels of color, and then their parents complained to the board. Um, they have an issue where they try to uh, they try to evict one young woman, and she says, you can't, you can't throw me out, you work for my dad. <laughs> and, uh, and they say, what, what are you, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, in fact, she, you know, her, her father is, uh, you know, 
Davidson Penn, who's the head of the White League, this, this white vigilante organization. Um, before the war, he had had a mixed race lover across town and had had a daughter with her. And she lived, you know, on the other side of town, but he'd always kind of, you know, supported her. Uh, and in fact, you know, she was his daughter and she wasn't white. And, you know, the, the, all, of these, all of these issues um, come up. And it, the, the, the French part of town, which had always, you know, which, which had used a, a racial system much more like Latin America, um, which, you know, where there's, there's certainly rampant colorism, but there's not a clear line of white and person of color. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in Brazil or Mexico, um, your life will be easier if you have green eyes than if you have brown eyes, but there's no, there's no like green eyes only schools. You know, if you go to a high class school in Mexico, there'll be more kids who have green eyes. You go to a low class school in Mexico, there'll be more kids who have brown eyes, but there's no like, this school is for people with green eyes only and this school is for brown eyes only. And as absurd as this sounds, this is essentially what was done in the American South um, and parts of the American Midwest uh, with, this, with this racial category. Um, so this, the, the racial system really does get dropped on downtown New Orleans um, as like a pile of bricks all at once in reaction, uh, right after the, in reaction to the unification movement actually. Um, I mean, critical race theorists talk about a 400 year process to kind of create white and black. Um, stretching from the first Portuguese explorations of the coast of Africa and really culminating in, 18, in the 1850s when the one drop rule is first formulated. Uh, the one drop rule that any uh, African descent makes an American a, a, person, a colored person. Um, and this is formulated by an editor, a newspaper editor in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, who claims that he can spot an American with 31 European great-great-grandparents and one African great-great-grandparent by, among other things, examining the individual's feet. Um, so th this is, this is the, the race science on some level we still live under um, to this day. And you see how ham-fisted it is by watching it get imposed uh, on New Orleans all at once. I mean, there's literally an editorial uh, in the French from France newspaper uh, in favor of this. In an 1873 editorial entitled, D'un côté ou de l'autre, to one side or the other, the Carillon implored citizens to choose definitively whether they were white or black. Quote, it is time to say it plain, the paper declared. One must be either white or black, let each man decide. There are two races here, one of them superior and the other inferior. Their separation is absolutely necessary. Let's split from now on into two. Now, of course, this is easier said than done because it begs the question, this only puts off the question further. Well, what, is the, what are the criteria? Uh, by which we will determine who is what. Uh, so just a month later, the paper offered a new set of racial boundaries that crossed lines of nationality, language, religion, and skin tone. In a pseudoscientific disquisition on race, Le Carillon pleaded no contest to the idea that Spaniards had mixed with Arabs during the centuries-long Moorish occupation of the Iberian Peninsula. But regardless, the paper insisted, Spaniards remained white. Quote, our fellow Spanish citizens are descended to a large extent from Arabs, but Arabs are white, the newspaper informed its readers, just tanned by exposure to light and to the sun, <laughs> as are all whites who live out in the open in the hot countries, such as the Jews. Those still beyond the widening boundaries of whiteness found themselves pushed towards this growing category of blackness, which expanded to encompass creels of color and anyone else known to have a drop of African blood, regardless of complexion or status before the Civil War. And you literally see uh, the, the people kind of at the, the fringes of whiteness who had initially been aligned with civil rights um, defecting to the white supremacist side. Um, so this is a, the White League, you know, forms an, uh, for, Luckily for historians, but um, you know, they didn't wear masks like the Klan. This is like not a secret society. This is a public white supremacist organization. They publish their roles uh, once they are successful in uh, retaking uh, Louisiana. Um, and you see, um, you see the names you might expect, like uh, Richards and, and White, but you also see um, French names uh, and German names, and you see, I mean, Jewish names, Hyman. You see Hispanic names, Garcia. Um, the Garcia fellow, it's, it, I'm, it, it would appear he's the same Garcia. Like there's a Garcia, there's an A, a period Garcia in the Committee of 100 supporting civil rights, and there's an A period Garcia who ends up in the White League only a year later. Um, and historians have definitely traced some uh, folks who defect from this unification campaign to the, to the White League specifically. Um, as you remember, 
probably from American history um, when you took it, um, the 1876 election is disputed. Uh, and to resolve the dispute, uh, white supremacist Democrats are given the state governments of Louisiana and South Carolina in exchange. A Republican uh, is seated as the president, but on uh, secretly agreeing to withdraw any federal civil rights enforcement uh, from, the, from the South. Um, as I mentioned, some of the institutions take a very long time to resegregate, like the uh, police departments and the streetcars, but the schools, it happens almost immediately. Um, the University of South Carolina is resegregated immediately, as are the New Orleans public schools, so they're not without resistance, including from this gentleman. The uh, newly seated governor, uh, Governor Nichols, uh, took a meeting with a group calling themselves the Colored Committee on Mixed Schools that were trying to keep the schools integrated. Um, he has to take the meeting because they're, well, first of all, they, they all still vote at this point. The, the revo revocation of voting rights takes uh, years, decades even, uh, in some instances. And they're also very well, they're well-to-do constituents. Um, their, their total net worth of this 20, 20 male group is uh, several million dollars, according to the New York Times coverage of the meeting. Uh, it's probably inflated. They, they were the source of all the information the Times was getting, but they were, um, you know, they were wealthy men, and he took the meeting, even though he opposed civil rights. So Governor Nichols tried to steer the conversation back into legalistic minutia, but George T. Ruby, shown left, decades younger than the Colored Committee on Mixed Schools leadership, rose in a rage. The Manhattan-born son of a white clergyman and a free woman of color, Ruby had spent most of Reconstruction in Texas before moving to New Orleans to work as a journalist and customs official. Now he played the ultimate race card on the governor. The Creole of color community, he told Nichols, knew which families were passing for white in New Orleans society, even if their white lives had gone on for generations. If the governor insisted on segregating the schools, the colored committee would start outing prominent white families as the one-drop rural people of color they were. If the activists' own children were forced into segregated schools, he warned, they would drag out scores of ostensibly white students with them. Quote, I believe it is dangerous in a community like this, of doubtful ancestry, to push this matter further, Ruby told the governor in a thinly veiled threat. Quote, for we have those facts in our possession, which it would be unpleasant to some in high circles were we to use them, which we must do in the event of separate schools, unquote. Ruby and his committee men were not the only Americans of mixed background. Mixing was rampant and had gone on for centuries. They were just the rare Americans who never tried to cover it up. Racial passing went to the very highest levels of Louisiana society. Even Randall Lee Gibson, shown right, the white supremacist Democrat, who with the collapse of Reconstruction now represented New Orleans in the United States Congress, was secretly descended from a free man of color. Gibson's family lore had long attributed the family's off-white complexion to their descent, quote, from an English lord who had fallen for a gypsy maid. Right. They're so dark because they're British royalty. It's a great, it's a great line. Um, later generations speculated that their family was variously part Portuguese, Native American, Sephardic Jewish, Moroccan, or Turkish, anything but the sub-Saharan truth. Um, and I love showing these two men side by side because basically from the forehead to the chin, they really look like brothers or cousins. And one reader at one point, or one uh, audience member says, maybe they were, you know? <laughs> and indeed, maybe they were. Um, uh, but, and yet, you know, what, what is race? These men are, are identified differently. They're at each other's throats in, in the period. Um, and, and they're fighting, uh, one is fighting for white supremacy and one is fighting for equal rights uh, for all. Um, this, you know, re Reconstruction is overturned, and the, but the, uh, particularly in New Orleans, the Creoles of color keep fighting on. The final battle is in the courts with the Plessy case. Um, and that's in the 1890s. So we think of like Reconstruction collapse in the mid-1870s and then there was segregation. No, it took, it took a long time to build and there was resistance the whole way. Um, and the final resistance is this Plessy case um, that's in the tradition of that earlier case I read. Um, that we, it's, it's especially because it's often taught to middle school children, which it should be. Um, it's not taught with the kind of sophistication and this, this, this needling at race that I think is really is integral to the case and really interesting. Um, so this is not Homer Plessy. There are, despite what the internet says, there are no known pictures of Homer Plessy. Um, this is the next best thing. This is Daniel Day Dune, who was the initial plaintiff who was tapped to, to lead this test case, and his case was thrown out on a technicality. Um, but uh, there, was, there was a decision made to choose somebody whose, whose racial background could not be uh, immediately discerned. Um, and Homer Plessy in the African-American newspaper in New Orleans is described as being, quote, as white as the average white Southerner. 
Um, so they purposefully pick a kind of person whose racial background is mixed and unclear. And then they make this part of their argument. Um, audaciously, Plessy's attorney, Albion Tourget, uh, in 1896, brought the Creole of color community's long tradition of courtroom challenges to the reality of race to the highest court in the land. Quote, is not the question of race scientifically considered very often impossible of determination, Tourget asked? And yet the Louisiana law leaves this oft impossible racial categorization, this is the law segregating street, uh, train cars, to quote, the casual scrutiny of a busy conductor, unquote, deputizing a marginally educated ticket taker as quote, the autocrat of caste, armed with the power of the state conferred by this statute, unquote. The only way to accurately enforce the law, Torje chided, would be to have every Louisianan, quote, carry a certified copy of his pedigree, unquote, every time he or she boarded a train. Short of that, conductors would be required to walk the aisles making spot judgments about the ethnicities of each passenger's various great-grandparents. This bizarre nightmare of racial autocracy, Torje warned, would be the end point of any Supreme Court decision upholding the law. The only solution was a determination that the post-war amended constitution was colorblind. Quote, justice is pictured blind and her daughter the law ought to be colorblind, Torje declared. It took the court just a month to issue their near unanimous decision. Justice Henry Billings Brown, shown here, a Massachusetts-born Republican, wrote for the majority. A proud member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Brown fancied himself a Renaissance man, and he kept up with all the latest developments in the science of race. In his autobiography, the justice bragged of his own inbreeding, crediting it for making him so healthy and wise. Quote, I was born of a New England Puritan family in which there has been no admixture of alien blood for 250 years, Brown wrote in the book's very first sentence. Perhaps realizing that some might find this touting of his racial purity potentially racist, his second sentence noted, quote, my ancestors were neither bigoted nor intolerant. Having inherited his broad-mindedness from generations of inbred Anglo-Saxon forebearers, Brown based his decision not on benighted backwoods bigotry, but on the hard-headed realism built upon the scientific facts he had imbibed as a student at Harvard and Yale. Racial animosity, the justice wrote, is, quote, in the nature of things, unquote. It was the government's role to deal with this fact of human nature rather than engage in a quixotic crusade to stamp it out. To this end, racial segregation on a separate but equal basis seemed to him eminently reasonable. As for Tourget's attack on the reality of distinct races, or the racially unplaceable Homer Plessy's physical phenotypic questioning of the whole concept, Brown demurred. Each state could define race as it saw fit. The justice freely admitted that he personally couldn't say whether Plessy was white or colored, and that different states would no doubt categorize him differently. Still, Brown insisted each state was free to make whatever determination it saw fit. And indeed, of course, this, you know, this separate this case in favor of separate but equal opens the floodgates to segregating ever more areas of American life. The streetcars of New Orleans are resegregated in 1902, as I mentioned. This is a lithograph from the Daily Paper explaining how this new system is going to work. The, the screens that divide the races. Uh, it's a movable screen will be placed in front of the, to divide the white and colored sections of the streetcar. The resegregation of the streetcars in Charleston, as I mentioned, doesn't happen until 1912. 1912. Um, and as individuals are forced to kind of put themselves into the white or, or colored um, boxes, uh, different families make different decisions, and even different family members make different decisions. Uh, e. Arnold Burtonow, who had lobbied President Lincoln, um, and in fact had led the, brought the first federal uh, case against school segregation in American history on behalf of his son, who's A.J. Burton, uh, you know, obviously grown in this picture at, at the, on the other side. Um, they moved to California and uh, become white people. Um, the son, A.J. Burton, who's the first, the child plaintiff uh, in the first federal school desegregation case, uh, joins the, the whites only Pasadena Hunt Club um, and ends up running the Tournament of Roses parade. Um, I speculate maybe because he was drawn to the parade because he had been excluded from the Mardi Gras parades on the basis of being, of being a black man in New Orleans in his youth, or child. Um, the Cardozo family goes through similar, um, the, the, they bifurcate. The kind of, the, the ostensibly white, I mean, by, by white we're saying the, the Latino Jewish side of the family um, is now encompassed in this white category and the scion of that family famously goes on to become uh, justice of the, the Supreme Court, Benjamin Nathan Cardozo. Uh, meanwhile, while he's literally, while he's sitting on the Supreme Court, the 
African-American side of the family is running a hairstyling business, you know, blacks only hairstyling businesses near Howard University, right across town uh, in Washington, D.C., you know, two miles apart from each other, um, both, you know, thriving within the confines of the, the race they're allowed to run, but uh, obviously those races, you know, one being on the Supreme Court and the other running a successful small business uh, are totally unequal. Uh, similar kind of sit here, the, the, the Greener family fractures along generational lines. Um, Richard T. Greener uh, continues to fight for civil rights, um, and his, his own actual racial presentation puzzles people, especially once his hair goes white, so he's like, in different situations, he's perceived differently, and he's kind of becomes kind of a master of working his way through the system. His daughter um, changes her name to Belle da Costa Green, uh, claims to be of Portuguese descent, and ends up becoming the librarian to uh, J.P. Morgan, um, and build, build the J.P. Morgan, the famous J.P. Morgan Library in New York City, um, is is her essentially her baby, and she's the expert on the manuscripts, so when, you know, when there's an auction in France or Italy, she's the one telling J.P. Morgan, okay, bid on this one and bid on this one and we want that, but not that. Um, and she's here, this is a clip of her from a paper in the Midwest uh, in the 20s, and it's in, you know, she's being celebrated as women who earn big wages. She, her salary is over, in, in current money from J.P. Morgan, she's making over $300,000 a year, uh, which most librarians would kill for <laughs> um, to this day. Um, and then you even have people who, uh, including Homer Plessy himself, who are constantly kind of recategorized in different racial ways. So in the 1910 census, Homer Plessy is recorded as being black. The 1920 census, Homer Plessy is being recorded uh, as white. Um, and in, in these days, in those days, it's the census taker um, just determines, you know, based on their own impression, what an American's race is. Um, and it, it, it is the, the, the 1910. Uh, the 1910 census is the first one with the, the, just the categories of black and white and all the mixed categories have been removed. Um, so the mixed categories, I mean, we don't like the word mulatto for obvious reasons. It's a problematic word. It comes from the word for mule, which is based on the concept that people of different races, when they reproduce, will have sterile offspring, uh, which is not true, <laughs> as you know. Um, but, it, but at least there, there was, uh, in the census, in the federal census in the 1800s, there was a, a uh, mixed race category, and that category is removed um, and only reappears uh, in 2000, which in the way that you're now permitted to check multiple boxes. Um, so here, Homer Plessy himself is in different sides. Um, that, and that is why I um, call my work a Technicolor History of the First Civil Rights Movement and its collapse into black and white. So, thank you. Well, this, this isn't a very impressive question, but I'm just curious <laughs> if um, you've done uh, 23andMe or Ancestry yeah. for yourself. Yes, and I have, yeah. I'm just interested in how you why you decided to do that. Was it an outgrowth of this? Yeah. And, and what, has it made any difference yes, to you? Had, yes, I'm glad you asked. No one, I think people have been too nervous to ask me that, but thank you. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, I did it because my... Uh, my partner's stepmom, like for Christmas, which I don't celebrate because I identify as Jewish, um, got us got us uh, twenty three you know ancestry dot com as a gift for Christmas. Um, so I did it. Um, I am a um, very Seattle person. I'm I'm a mixed Jewish and Scandinavian. Um, and and when I did the when I got the results back, the they give you a, a dotted line around the, 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 the places they're confident you're from, and then they give you little snippets of places you're also probably have roots. So the, the dotted lines were, um, did encompass uh, what are, I mean, they're now all different countries, all the countries that my uh, great grandparents lived in, which are um, modern day uh, Norway, which was at the time they immigrated, essentially a colony of Sweden, um, and then uh, Latvia, Belarus and Ukraine, which were used to be, were all part of the, the, the Tsarist Empire and went at the time my ancestors left. Um, but then I also got um, <clears throat> all this other stuff, uh, this kind of long arc, um, literally from, uh, from Ireland to India, um, of you know, little pieces of you know, low confidence. But uh, so I, I, mean, I, I thought that was cool. I don't, I've definitely had um, 
like cab drivers in South Asia be like, you have, a, you have an Indian face, man. You're totally part us. You just don't know it. Um, so, you know, maybe they were right. But um, I, I think it is, a, no, it was, it was interesting to learn that, you know, I, my under, well, first of all, my identity is already weird enough because in like Europe, um, you know, certainly in a, it's, it's sort of a biracial identity in Europe and a white identity in America being Scandinavian and Jewish. Um, certainly under fascist rule, it was a biracial identity. Um, but then, you know, having this multi, multiple continent thing kind of thrown in was interesting too. Although my last book ended on, uh, which is about Asia, ended on the, how the distinction between Europe and Asia was created and why. It's very much like the black-white distinction we have here. I mean, any four-year-old looks at a map and will insist to you correctly that Asia and Europe are one piece of land. Um, the reason we treat them as different continents um, goes back to the ancient Greeks who decided that the people living across the Aegean Sea, which was even then a boat ride away, were barbarians. So they must be Asian. And we're civilized Europeans and they're barba barbarian Asians. And because of the Greek sources in the Middle Ages, there, were, there was an assumption that once the world was fully explored, they would find the border between Europe and Asia. And they never found it, so they decided the Ural Mountains is the border between Europe and Asia. The Ural Mountains are, they're not even like the Olympics. Like, I mean, the Ural Mountains are something that people in the Middle Ages could walk, or could hike across. Like, you know, with a, you port, ported your canoe for a little bit. Um, so, you know, so the idea that I have roots on multiple continents, I think is kind of awesome, but I also think this, like, the distinction of between Europe and Asia is almost as ridiculous as the distinction between, you know, white Americans and black Americans too, so. And created for similar reasons. Can you talk more about the accusation against uh, Abraham Lincoln and his, ra and his yeah. race? Was it during his campaign? Yeah, during all of his president? campaigns, yeah, during all, I'm, I'm not, I'm like hardly an expert on it, but during, yeah, during all of his campaigns, um, in part because he's hostile to slavery, um, and is, he's actually not as sympathetic to equal rights for African Americans as we're taught in grade school, uh, but because he's anti-slavery and because he's like, I mean, I don't, it's, he's like as tall as an NBA player in the 1800s and that's just weird. Um, yeah, and his, you know, his skin color and his hair color, people are like, well, he's, if he's against slavery and he's six and a half feet tall and he has black hair and he has tan skin, like, God damn it, he's gotta be, you know, part, African American, um, and that that's a recurring accusation in his political career. It's a it's a recurring uh, rumor on the internet. Um, the other thing is like who knows. The other thing is like it's not. I'm like, I mean, I would say it doesn't. Obviously, it doesn't matter, but it's also possibly true. I mean, I I pulled a map. Sometimes I show this map. It's not in this presentation, but it's from 23andMe, and it's a map of the United States by state with what percentage of white identified people in that state are of Afri traceable African descent. Um, and of course, Louisiana and South Carolina are the highest. Over 10% of the white people in those states, white identified people are of African descent. But Kentucky also um, comes up very high, um, which is where you know, he's born. Um, so like, who's, who's to say? I mean, his descendants, well, we could find this out now, right? We, we, his descendants could swab their cheeks and we could figure this out. Um, so if any of you are descended from the Lincolns, please do so. We, we, inquiring minds want to know. Um, as you've traveled across the country and doing a book tour, um, have the audience members shared any personal anecdotes, like uh, where they've talked to their grandfathers, like, oh, um, this is how it really was like, and uh, any controversies as you've gone across the country, people in the audience that have I would, disagreed with you mm -hmm. or anything? Yeah, I've, talked I've, about? I've definitely um, gotten people, you know, who told me that when they, they took the 23andMe test, like some things they weren't expecting. Um, came up. I also, it was really exciting um, doing events in New Orleans and Charleston to meet, um, you know, openly mixed race descendants of some of the people in the book. Like in my Charleston talk, I showed the picture of one of the uh, high ranking African American policemen from Reconstruction. And then at the end of the talk, someone was like, oh, that's my great grandfather. I was like, whoa, oh my God. Um, so that was, that was really cool too. Um, I was really super, as someone who uh, I can definitively say is not African American. I'm, purely from Eurasia, um, as my DNA attests, um, I was a little bit nervous kind of stepping into this space. Um, and I've just been so heartened by uh, the reception I've gotten in, in venues like this. Um, I've, 
a, a few times I've gotten sort of challenging questions, um, but I've always, you know, given the, the kind of the best answer I can muster, and it's 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 been great. I mean, one, you know, uh, one African American gentleman in a reading in New Orleans said, you know, so what's the point of your book? Should it, uh, so like white people should like hang their heads in shame and cry and burrow into themselves in a ball? But it was it was like a, and I was like, well, you know, that's. It might not be the worst thing, but it's not exactly what I'm what I'm saying. And, and I um, I ended up reading this quote, which is the very last thing I read. I added to the book. It's a James Baldwin quote. Um, if I can find it, uh, I will find it. I think I know it by heart. It's um, it's up to you. As long as you think you're white, there's no hope. As long as you think you're white, I'm going to be forced to think I'm black. Um, which I think, which I take to mean that, um, you know, race is a destructive social construct, um, but it's, it's up to white identified Americans to take the first step. Um, and that's what I told the, the gentleman. Uh, and afterwards he gave me a hug and said, God bless you. And it was great. Um, and I've just been so impressed. In Memphis, we had a little crosstalk within the audience between a younger African American, uh, you know, maybe 20 something and a like 60 something. And they were having like a constructive, but you know, kind of dis, you know, disagreement in front of the audience. It was just great. I've just been so impressed, especially from the sense I was, what I was anticipating, which is, um, you know, let alone the like, what you, what you might hear on, on Fox News. I, you know, I don't expect, those people are not gonna show up to my reading probably. But even the, the kind of racial debate you, you find in the more respectful spaces, like, you know, the New York Times or Slate or, you know, um, it, it just seemed like, actual Americans are so much more sophisticated and compassionate uh, about these and open about these things than the uh, impression you would get from just sort of following these issues in the media. Uh, and that's really been uh, inspiring. When am I going to hear you on Fresh Fresh? Well, if you, if you know, <laughs> thanks. If you, if you know Terry Gross. Um, <laughs> Give her a call. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, no, it's a good question. I'm, um, so my last book was about a really kind of very obscure topic, was about the history of building instant modern cities in the developing world, um, which when I would tell people what it was about, they'd be like, oh, well, I'm glad you're interested in that. Um, <laughs> and that got, that got tons of coverage all over the place. Um, and this is about like something that seems like really hot and current, and it's gotten a lot less coverage. So I don't know how the media works. I only write for it sometimes. Um, but yeah, if you want to please spread the word about the book uh, and read a cop get a copy and read it and pass it on. Well, uh, one more question. I just had a question about sure, yeah. um, the origins of Jim Crow, and that um, I had read someplace that. <clears throat> that Jim Crow started because uh, poor blacks and whites were organizing in the South and that this was, uh, I think this was in New Orleans. Um, did you run across this? Yeah, there, um, um, in, at the kind of macro sense, I think it's, uh, I think it's quite clear that um, the Jim Crow system, yeah, is used to divide uh, people along racial lines so they don't unite along class lines. Um, in the, but it, it is it's sort of a wrinkle for what I'm writing about because I'm the activists who are taking the lead again I say because of because there is no NAACP legal defense fund and there is no ACLU are essentially pretty posh people um, they're 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 they were kind of they're from a, a bourgeois class that is uh, as the system moves from uh, you know class or even caste based inequality to a race based inequality revolt um, and then side with people who in some cases, you know, they had, some of them, these folks had even been slave owners themselves, um, end up in a political alliance with the freedmen, meaning the, former, uh, the formerly enslaved. So it's a study in, in kind of strange political um, coalitions. And I think that, you know, that can make, um, and I do get some, I do hear this from audiences sometimes, that can make some of my kind of heroes a little bit unsympathetic. Um, and look, they're real people and they, we all have our, pros and cons, um, but I think it is important to, pun intended, keep our eyes on the prize. I mean, if these, if these um, you know, bourgeois activists had won the right to ride in, you know, in a, in a first-class train compartment, uh, 
Um, yes, that would not have done much for people who couldn't afford a first class train compartment. And they're trying to, you know, they desegregate the Opera House of New Orleans and Charleston. And it's like, well, if you're not going to the Opera, what does that get you? At the same time, um, in the biggest possible sense, if the United States had moved from the slavery period and the Civil War and emerged as a republic where everyone had equal rights regardless of race, uh, we would undoubtedly be in a much better place uh, than we are today. Thanks.